That's the video. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for taking time to join today's session for the ROI driven digital marketing. I am Christine Yap, your moderator for today's session. So um, I would like to share a bit of house rules with all of you today. Okay, so please make sure that your first name and last name is displayed at all times so that we can ensure some uh, meaningful engagement later. And uh, to minimize the class disruptions, participants will be muted. So you are encouraged to turn on your video um, as and when uh, we have any engagement sessions. So if you do have any questions, you may type them in the Zoom chat function. So uh, please do not use the raise hand function as it may disrupt the whole uh, progress. Um, please be advised that the webinar will be recorded. So the organizing committee reserves the rights to redistribute for uh, the recording in the future. Um, the last thing is to sit back, enjoy the learnings that Mr. Jin Kwok will be sharing to you later. So uh, the program schedule for today would be um, an introduction on the program flow by myself. Next, we will move on to the uh, ROI, share, uh, ROI on digital marketing by Mr. Jin Kwok. Moving on, we will have a Q&A session and we will have a closing after that. So um, before we comments on the webinar session, I would like to just share a little bit about the organizers of uh, this webinar session. So it's actually, um, the session is actually a part of series of pro uh, business and skills enrichment series organized by the Singapore Young Entrepreneurs Award Committee. And um, we are a youth empowerment initiative founded by a team of youth passionate in making an impact in both the business and also in the community. So SYEA is a description on what is SYEA. So Singapore Young Entrepreneurs Award. Singapore Young Entrepreneurs Award is, uh, we are more than just an award. So. Um, I believe everyone here will actually know that COVID-19 has made year 2020 a very challenging year for all um, individuals and businesses. So however, with every challenge comes an opportunity. So the pandemic has shown the importance of being resilient and also innovative to stay afloat. And it is vital for businesses to be able to tide through this challenging period while strategizing to thrive in the post-COVID-19 economy. Hence, rather than just the award, um, these are some of the programs that we have prepared for uh, the participants. If you are interested, uh, do uh, at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the seminar, we will actually show you our email address. Do reach out to us. Um, these are also rather than just the business programs. Of course, we also have uh, a series of awards. So, uh, these are the six categories that we will be focusing on. So, if you do the nominations eligibility are for people. Um, business owners that are 25 years and below that, ha that have a registered company incorporated in Singapore. Um, the person has to be a Singaporean or a Singaporean PR and also holds more than 30% of the company share. So if you do know someone of uh, that caliber or you yourself, you are also a, a very successful young entrepreneur yourself, do um, nominate now. Our contact details are here. Do send in uh, your contact details or the nominees information for us to contact them at nominations at syea.cc. So next, without further ado, I would like to also um, invite our key guest speaker for today. His name is Mr. Jean Kwok. Jean is a formal general manager an experienced marketer, and also founder of a digital marketing agency, Demzai Private Limited. So the agency has worked uh, with and continues to build successful campaigns um, with and continue to build uh, marketing for companies across a wide range of industries, including fitness, wellness, furniture, interior design, 
beauty, non-for-profit, nutrition, e-commerce, and mobile app. So without further ado, um, over to Jean. Okay, uh, thank you, Christine. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here to share with you some of the, you know, regarding this digital marketing. And I, I think that SYE is a great cause that I'm very happy to support. Uh, okay, I think, let me just, I need to share my screen, right, Christine? Okay. Okay, can you guys see my screen now? All right, let me just. Uh... Okay, thanks for joining us today. Uh, you know, uh, basically, what I'm going to share today is basically, you know, the topic, as you know, is digital marketing. As you know, digital marketing is the latest buzzword that's on everyone's lips, especially after COVID 19. Everyone is talking about digital marketing, you know, it's a big word. There's so many different aspects and components. Uh, for example, uh, you know, you, if you're SEM, you hear about SEO, you hear about PPC, right? Uh, you know, uh, email marketing, messenger marketing, social media platforms, and there's so many, right? Facebook, Google, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, Pinterest, uh, TikTok, you know, there's so many new platforms coming up. So the question is, what really works? And, you know, the short answer is, uh, well, different tools work for different things. But I think that, uh, you know, looking at the participants today, I've actually adjusted the presentation slightly to suit the participants of today because I took a look at the list. I see that there are a lot of uh, small business owners, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurs or, or, you know, like small home-based businesses that want to actually run, um, you know, interesting campaigns, but mainly for the purpose of uh, acquiring leads, inquiries, and sales. So not so much of that kind of, uh, you know, like uh, what we call a brand awareness, purely marketing. Ultimately, the goal of marketing in this case is really to get leads, inquiries, and sales. So that's actually what we focus on, um, ROI-driven digital marketing. Okay, so, all right. So, so for today's session, I'll be focusing a lot on this particular area. Uh, okay, let me just calm down. Okay, um, all right. So I'm just gonna give a brief outline of what I'll be sharing today, okay? And I think that this one, you can, if, as you notice, it's not really a webinar session. It's, a, it's more like a Zoom call meeting, right? So you guys, you know, if you, if you want, you can turn on your audio at some point and if you, if you have questions to ask or anything, we'll go into that. So it'll be more of like an interactive session, I hope. It's not, not just, you know, more like a prepared webinar. All right, and the first thing I wanted to cover is really what are some of the common misconceptions about digital marketing? Okay, and then I will talk about, you know, what's the difference between organic-based uh, digital marketing and paid advertising, all right? And then uh, I will really go into, you know, um, the five ingredients towards creating a powerful digital campaign that drives actual leads, inquiries, and sales. So this one is going to be very hands-on. Um, I'm really going to show you the five components. And each of these five components, right, uh, it's a topic on itself. It's really, you really can spend a long time talking about each of these because it's quite detailed. But I'm not going to go so, you know, into each of the areas, otherwise we wouldn't have time. So I want to go a broad overview, but I will tell you the key points that you have to take note of when you want to create a campaign like that. So by the end of the whole session, right, uh, you should be able to, um, you know, for some of the business owners, you'll be able to understanding of how this, this entire thing works. Uh, the mechanisms and more importantly if you want to create a campaign you should really have an idea of like where to start already okay and then fourth i will share some real life case studies and examples of actual campaigns that we've run for uh, companies in singapore businesses some brands you might have heard of some smaller brands some startups but i will show you the real life uh, case studies and examples uh, in relation to the things that i'm going to share so that you can draw you know the parallel and understand okay like how this fits in and then I want to spend more time on the Q&A segment uh, because I actually, be, when, you, when you guys sign up, I saw that there were some questions that you have and all that. And I want to go into those um, specific questions. Uh, you know, we could even talk specifically about your business if you're open, uh, you know, for the learning of everyone in the, in the call. All right. And uh, okay. So first of all, I'll start off, right? Right. Let's just go dive right into it. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. 
this thing. So uh, like, uh, like I said, along the way, I'll show you some real life examples of campaigns uh, that we've helped build, right? Um, but there are some I cannot really discuss in detail because of uh, NDA agreements that I have with these clients. Um, and I, I also will not share anything that is key to their strategy or can affect their competitive advantage because it is quite uh, critical um, on this point. So feel free to you know, take notes of what I've, I'm sharing or take photos if you wish or anything, but please do not capture the specific brands that I'm going to share the details of the campaigns. Uh, more importantly, um, or if you really, you know, you do happen to capture it by chance, uh, please do not share them because you know, this is, uh, you know, actually the creatives are done for the clients. Okay, so whatever I'll be sharing today is purely for learning and discussion purpose. Okay, all right. Uh, Christine, if you see any questions coming or anything, any, any, at any point, you can just stop me and I'll, I, I can address them as well. Especially the part about the five components because it's going to be quite uh, broad. So, you know, I, I foresee that maybe you want to know a little bit more. All right, let's dive right in. Uh, first of all, let me share just one case study, okay? The reason I share this case study is so that you understand where I'm coming from, uh, from the overall picture, right? Okay, so this uh, is one of, this was one of our clients. Uh, it's Ulo. I'm, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of Ulo. It's basically an app that offers discounts for customers. Uh, basically, they work with salons, spas, uh, massage parlors, you know, other and other beauty and wellness related merchants. So you know that all these salons and all that, right? They have a common problem, which is they are very booked during certain peak seasons, and during off peak hours they have no traffic at all. So what this app does basically is offer discounts during off peak hours. Uh, you know, to consumers. So if you book, if you want to get a haircut, you can go into the app and, you know, you search uh, off-peak hours, like let's say 2 p.m., you'll probably be able to get a discount at some of the salons and all that, a good discount. There's a little bit like Itigo, if for, for those of you who know Itigo, it's a buffet, you know, you can uh, go to restaurants at off-peak hours and get a discount, something like that. But it's more for the beauty industry, all right? And this particular client, when they were introduced to us by another client, uh, referral, right? Um, they have already worked with a social media agency for eight months and they spent more than $10,000, right? So this founder was a little bit uh, uh, jaded by the results because he said that after the end of eight months, I only have, I see a lot of new followers on my page, right? Um, but very few actual downloads and users. So I see people following my page, but I don't see them actually, you know, um, using the app or downloading the app even, right? Uh, so what has happened? So basically, when we, you look at the campaign, right, you see that, wow, true enough, there's a lot of content that's being created. You see a lot of posts on the Instagram and Facebook feed, very nicely designed posts, you know, with models and all that kind of stuff. All right. So, but, but it, they didn't really see much results from there. All right. So anyway, we, we got, we, we, we told the client, firstly, because it was a referral from an existing client. So uh, they already had some trust. We also heard, heard good things about us. By the way, I'm not trying to promote, I'm just trying to share the, the case study so you understand. Huh? Then, uh, you know, and then the other unique thing is that because of the way that we structured our agency is a little bit unique, we remove any minimum, like normally in a digital agency, they will say, okay, you must commit to six months or 12 months with us. But uh, in our case, we, we actually remove that. There's no minimum months. So we don't have a six month or 12 month retainer. We actually operate month by month because we feel that the client should at least see growth month to month, or at least they should see their sales and all that in a way that they will want to continue working with us month to month. So we don't tie them down, we leave it to them. We are putting more of like the pressure on us to perform. Okay, um, so in essence, what happened was within three months of working together, okay, we acquired 7,000 new users for them. All right, in the, in the first month, we were able to grow more users than the, the other eight, the, the eight months combined. So in month one, we were able to grow more users than the first eight months of social media combined. All right, and then the app started to see regular bookings and traffic from customers and users. And it also made its debut on the trending uh, app store list for lifestyle category. So those, of, those apps that are on there are usually like a million downloads kind. So it was on a good track, right? Uh, so it's, it's, you know, here you can see you know, basically uh, uh, some words from a testimonial from the founder. So they said they, they achieve an 8, 8, 8x uh, app user growth in the first three months. And, you know, it's really a game changer if you know how to use it. And, you know, certainly it, it influences how he would approach his uh, business in future. So I hope that after today's sharing, right, you have the same uh, realization, like what is the real thing that matters, which I'm going to share with you, the key thing that matters, and what is the obstacle that is preventing your social media from achieving a growth like that. 
All right, but maybe you know at this point you want I I like to ask a question, and um, what do you guys think is the cost? Uh, like what what makes the big difference? You know, from what the other the other the, I mean the social media agency was able to do and ask like what do you think actually moved the needle? You know, do you want to give it a guess? Maybe you can put in the chat box so that I get an idea of you know uh, what is your thoughts that a good funnel okay benedict won't say a good funnel actually the the, the thing is I, I don't want i will share with you the answer later but bef after that before i mean after sharing one more point um but i just want a, a good strategy okay a good strategy a good funnel actually segmentation targeting all right that's a good one uh yes in a sense Okay, I will just hold, leave it here for now and I'll move on to the next uh, SEO. <laughs> SEO, um, not really SEO in this case. Uh, but yes, you're kind of on the right track. I, I, will, I will move on to that. I will, I will come back to this point shortly, okay? So let's come, all right, now next one. Mm. Let me see, uh, just give me a while. Okay, so before I unveil the answer to you, I want to explain that this is a common misconception about digital marketing. It's a common misconception because I had the same misconception. A few years ago in my old company, before I started Demzai, right? Uh, I was working in another company and I was asked by my boss to conduct, <laughs> intentionally use of five interviews, it's great, okay. I was asked by my boss to conduct a social media uh, training for the team. So just imagine, right, we were a team, a company at the time, hundred, there, there are hundreds of us in the, in the company. And the reason that I was asked to conduct a social media training was because uh, I seem to be more social media like savvy. I have a lot of, I, I mean, I have more Facebook friends or Instagram followers than my other colleagues. Lah. But that's just because, you know, we are a bit younger and we post and all that, right? So, but that's the perception. So they'll say, okay, you know, you have Facebook friends, Instagram followers. And I did, at that point, I did write a few articles about work on uh, Facebook and there was some traction, like, you know, people actually responded. And from there, I think we got a lead or two, right? So, okay, since I was tasked to do this training, I went to prepare, uh, you know, the, my slides and, and did a training and all that, right? So I conducted a training. Uh, so basically in my training, these are the points that I share, okay? I, I actually said that, uh, first of all, right, you need to post very regularly, post content. So uh, every day, post at least one post regularly, you know, or at least schedule it. So you have a lot of like daily posts of daily updates of what you're doing or, you know, uh, related to the topic that your business is about. The second thing that I shared at the time is I said that it takes time. So don't expect fast results. Okay, as long as you're consistently posting day by day, people will start to look for you. Correct? Because you're building your brand awareness and all that, right? So the third thing I said was, uh, when, you, when you are starting out, you post, right? Get your friends, family, and colleagues to help like and share. Sounds, sounds very, very uh, familiar. You know, when you post something on your company Facebook page or your you know, business Facebook page, you ask, it hey, help me to like, like, uh, like, comment or share, you know, the kind of thing. Help me to share there, correct? But um, so this was one of the points that I shared, okay? And then I also said, do not always post about work. Mix it up with some fun posts like Merry Christmas or like, you know, different festivals. Lah. For example, National Day, then you write about National Day. You know, then uh, Chinese New Year, you write about uh, Chinese New Year posts. You know? So you have a variety of posts and you've got to consistently post. So that was what I shared in my training. So after I shared my training, right, I did the presentation very well. Everybody was very convinced and they thought that, you know, probably I know social media better than them. So everybody went to set up their own Facebook page my colleagues, right, all went to set up their own Facebook page. And they actually, you know, started to plan their social media calendar and started to post, post and post. So a few years later, right, uh, so this training, this was a while ago, a few years later, one day I suddenly recall that, hey, a few years back I did this training. So I was very curious, you know, whether, whether my colleagues were still following my advice. So I decided to check on some of this, my old colleague's Facebook page, uh, not the friend's page, but the, 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 the official page, right? So I was very surprised that they are still posting. That means I, I still see like a few days ago, they are still posting and posting and posting and posting. And I look, I look back, wow, they've been posting for a whole year, you know, a lot of little, little things here and there, like what I said, like, Merry Christmas, this and that, this and that. And then they spend time to design that 
that that actually that social media post you know like uh, for example the company logo and then like merry christmas and then maybe some articles they spend time to write content write articles write posts uh, you know post some client testimonials and all that so they spend actually spend a lot of time doing that right um but here's a funny thing when i look at the most recent post i saw three likes okay and the three likes one was my colleague herself one was our boss our boss at that time and the other one i don't know lah. so but basically only three likes okay so so basically she was posting for you know she's been following what i said you know posting regularly for that's why i say this is, was a misguided social media advice at the time because at the time i didn't know what i know now so it's a common misconception uh, that you have to do these things all right so my, now my question is right back to the same question why like that so after following that you know uh, religiously posting regularly for such a long period of time shouldn't the page have gained some followers or shouldn't have she have gotten some sales from that or no, or, or, or you know shouldn't it have gained traction what is the key problem behind this my question to you so please tell me in the comments uh, chat box what do you think the key problem is and i'll, I'll answer right after this No call to action. Mm, yes, one of the key things. Okay, saturation. Okay, saturation is quite close, but not the key answer that I'm looking for. No target audience, very close. Very close. Boosting at the wrong post. Okay, anything else? Not targeted. <laughs> okay, what else? Anyone? Not interesting. <laughs> Actually, very interesting. The post she she has all kinds. Not enough base, Facebook organic, uh, not relevant. Okay, well, uh, all of you are in a in a way in the right track. But the key answer is actually just now. Uh, someone said no targeted audience, right? No targeted audience. That is very close. But the answer I'm looking for is, uh, I even had the right answer. No targeted audience. There is no audience. It's not just no targeted audience. There's simply no audience. It's not even any audience, right? So why is this, right? Nobody's really reading except you and your friends. So why is this happening? All right, back in when Facebook started, you, you have to understand that when Facebook started, uh, you know, imagine how many friends you had Facebook, maybe not, not too many, 100 people, you know, not a lot of people on Facebook. So that space that when you scroll, right, you are, pro, pro, chances are you are reading the things that your friends wrote. But right now, there's so much content on Facebook, right? Somebody said saturation, there's so much content. And you are following so many friends and so many pages. Facebook cannot possibly show you everything that you're following. They cannot possibly show you that. So what happens is this is what we call organic reach, right? That means uh, the, 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 the amount of the percentage of reach that your post actually gets uh, delivered to. So organic reach has fallen steadily. It used to be something like 10%. Then it fell to about 6%. And now it's below 2%, right? And over here is 1.2%. I don't think it's that bad, but it's about 2%. So that, what that means is, let's say if you have 1,000 page followers, right? Only 20 people are actually seeing your post. So it doesn't matter how much you write. You can post all the Happy New Year, Chinese New Year, whatever, you know, Merry Christmas, but only those 20 people are actually seeing your post on average, right? And um, another thing is how Facebook decides who gets to see your post. Basically, they decide based on the affinity score. Affinity, affinity score is something that is the back end. Uh, that is that works in Instagram or Facebook. For example, Instagram. When you look at the Insta story, some some of the times you will notice that you see the stories of the friends that you interact with the most often uh, push to the front. And some friends like you never seem to, although they are you are following them, but you never ever seem to see their posts, although they are posting, because you are not interacting with them enough. So Facebook determines what you're interested in based on your actions. So for example, if you are all you are you are you know uh, you are interacting with this particular person a lot or this particular page or this particular brand then facebook will say okay you like this page you like this brand uh so we will show you their posts so here's the problem right this is the early on i said right ask your friends and colleagues to like and share your post this is a big mistake because if you do that okay um basically facebook will mark these people as highly interested in your post right and you end up showing this that means your whatever you're posting right ends up getting showed to only your friend, your closest friends and your colleagues and, you know, and your family. So what's the point, right? You're writing a lot of things and then you, you're, you're, you say you ask your friend, did you see my post? Yeah, yeah, I saw your post. 
then you ask your colleague, you know, did you like my post? Yeah, I shared and like. But it's always the same group of people. There's no new audiences. And the lifeblood for any business is always new audiences. New audiences to come in, new customers, traffic. So the key word is traffic, okay, which is actually one of the five components that I'll be talking about later. But I'll go a little bit deeper into that. Right? So new audiences, right, to be honest, really get to see your post unless your post goes viral. And the odds of that happening is very, very slim. It's not a predictable way of uh, marketing, right? You're writing, writing. So uh, is it possible that uh, for you to generate, am I, am I saying that content is not important? I'm not saying that. If you already have a base, a significant base of uh, customers, for example, if you're Coca-Cola or Nike, yes, you can post a lot of posts because your, your base is large enough. You know, your, your fans engage with you enough. You have that reach. So that works. But the problem with a lot of small businesses, especially or small Facebook pages that are starting up, right, is to get that initial traction. They don't have a initial traction or following, uh, you know, to, to get taken seriously. So when they are writing, they start off a page, they invite maybe 20, 30 or 50 people, some people, you know, 100 people, and then they slowly get people to like their page. But even if you get to 1,000, only 20 people are seeing your post on average. And then plus the shares and all that. So it's simply not worth the time until you've built a significant audience or if you have the resources, you can do it concurrently. But the most key, the key point I'm trying to bring across here is that traffic is very important. Okay. So what is the solution to that, right? Uh, the solution, right, is basically in essence advertising. So what is advertising, right? Advertising is the attempt to influence the buying behavior of consumers or clients with a persuasive selling message. So we've all seen ads on newspapers, TVs, magazines, radio, you know, flyers, all those are ads, right? Um, and it's a big industry, the ad advertising industry. Fun fact, you know, the Super Bowl, uh, Super Bowl commercial, a, a 30, sec 30 second commercial on Super Bowl cost 5 million just for that 30 seconds, right? And that doesn't even include the cost of producing that ad, that ad. you know, it's just the 30 second ad spend slot. So why do advertisers, right, spend so much money to put an ad on Super Bowl? Simply because the audience is big, right? So advertising is a way to get your products and services to a wider audience. You need to get your, your message out to a wider audience. So if you look at the previous examples, let's go back to Yulo, right? What they've done is they have a great product. It's a very, I mean, it's a good, it's a great app, right? But they had trouble getting people to know about the app. And they, they tried to share their friends and family, of course, that works, right? And then after that, they invested a sum of money towards social media branding. So they created a lot of social media posts and all that. But the problem is nobody is actually reading the posts. It's just their own, you know, group of, you know, it's just a very small audience. The second reason, earlier on someone mentioned, is also a call to action. The social media post has no call to action. The posts are all just, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, they're not really saying what this app about. You know, like, for example, uh, you know, beauty deals, Merry Christmas or whatever, you know, what has that got to do with uh, why you should download the app? So in essence, what, what, what we really did was, number one, we did a very detailed targeting and we got this uh, message out to a big audience. So we brought them traffic. That's how we got 7,000 users in three months. The second thing was there was a very clear call to action. Download the app, we just told them, right? And then the third thing was that in our copywriting, we, we put off a persuasive message to explain why you should download this app and why it's such a great addition to your uh, mobile phone, right? Um, I will share the specific ad with you and the examples later on, okay? I just want to go into mix. All right. I think I don't need to I don't need to elaborate too much on you know how social media has grown or you know the statistics of how much more time people are spending on social media or their mobile phones these days. I think a picture speaks a thousand words. And this picture says it all, right? Um, would you prefer your ad to be somewhere up here, you know, where the MRT, SMRT advertisements usually are placed? Where and you can see that nobody is actually looking at it, or would you prefer your ad to be here on the mobile phone? Everyone carries a mobile phone and everyone is glued to their phone these days. So yeah, it's only a matter of which channel you use to reach your audience, right? The key thing is someone, is, someone out there is looking for your services or your product or your solution. Someone out there is looking and they have a problem that you can solve for them. The question is how do you get to these audiences and get their attention 
and get them to take an action. Basically, that's about it in ROI-based marketing. That's all, that's all it is, all right? So let's go into the next. Okay, so earlier on I talked about how there are so many traditional forms of you know, um, social media, uh, traditional forms of uh, media. And I wanted to show the trend. In 2019, for the first time, digital ad spend added, exceeded traditional media ad spend. Okay, what that means is your digital ad spend online has exceeded all the traditional, your media corp, uh, your CNN, your US, uh, you know, Vogue, whatever, all your magazines and any form of traditional media ad spend, digital has actually exceeded that for the first time in history from in 2019. Okay, and who owns that large pie of digital ad spend, right? Actually only two players, Facebook and Google, because Facebook owns Instagram and WhatsApp, by the way, and Google owns YouTube. Together, these two players own about 50% of the global digital ad spend, more than 50%, about 52. So effectively, they are a dual poly. And why are they so effective and so powerful? Because they have integrated into every component of a life. Like you want to log into something, use Facebook. So Facebook and Google has more data based on our search patterns, based on our where we go, the location history and all that. They have more data on our behaviors and patterns than any other company in history. So, you know, in today's world, data is king. With that data, it's possible to create very, very frightening, frighteningly uh, effective digital campaigns. Okay. All right. Now let's go. In, right. Uh, no, 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 not this yet. All right. I want to tell you a little bit about. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the advantages of digital advertising. Okay. I will draw a parallel to traditional media so that it's easy to to see the difference here. Okay. The first thing. Supposing today we want to advertise in a. Uh, you know, in a, in a newspaper, right? We will have a rough a demographics given by the uh, publisher, you know, or magazine, right? They will say, okay, our readers are, you know, largely between 25 to 35, and then they are largely ladies, 60% and all that, right? So it's a very vague kind of demographics. It's possible, but still very vague. And then you assume that, for example, you want to do sports or men's, or, or men's related stuff, you put in men's health, right? It's very generic. But when you do... Um, digital advertising, you can actually hyper-target it to a very specific audience based on a specific age, right? For example, you can do it like uh, very, very narrow, like 25 to 30, and these are really people who are 25 to 30. You can also go by their, their other demographics, like if they're married, they're single. If they have one kid, they have two kids. If their kid is at a certain age, uh, you know, toddler, preschool, secondary school, you can also target them by their spending behaviors. Have they bought something online in the last month? I know it's kind of scary, right? And then you can also target them by their jobs, their search patterns, their interests. So it's very, very specific targeting. So this becomes very powerful because you're able to deliver, like I said, someone out there is looking for a service or a product and you're able to deliver the right message to them. It's very powerful. Okay, the second thing, it's, it's extremely measurable and trackable. For example, today I run an ad, right, on a magazine uh, or TV. It's very hard for me to say, actually, how much am I, receiving what uh what is the sales i'm receiving from this ad but because digital ad is very direct we are able to track at every stage for example when how much money are we spending uh you know per click to get them to view our website or view our landing page and in fact you can even track the sales you can track the number of add to carts you can track every little metric to every dollar and dime All right, and the third point is uh, it's actually extremely fast. Okay, so for example, let's say today, and also good for testing. So let me draw a, a parallel here again. If I want to launch a magazine ad, which I've done before in my old company, right? You know, we decide to put ads in magazines and TV and all that. So um, first you got to meet, you know, the person and then after discuss the ad spot, you've got to come up with a perfect ad because you only got one chance to get it right, right? And then probably will say our next issue is in two weeks. Then you have to get it done before two weeks and then you roll it out. And then you wait another one month or so and see whether anybody comes and then, you know, whether your business increase. If it increases, you also don't know whether it's coming from the ad or not, you know, it's kind of vague. So for digital advertising, right, you can launch an ad very quickly. Like I'm going to show you a case study I did, right, later. And um, it's good for testing. For example, now I'm interested to see whether my product is viable in the US, whether people in the US are interested in my product. I just launch an ad, spend maybe $100 and I can run an ad in the US and I will know from based on the statistics there, whether people are actually interested in my product or service, whether it's worth uh, me exploring this further, you know, before I invest into it. 
So it's very good for testing. And you can also test different messages for different audiences. And let's just jump to point five here. For example, I can test, uh, let's say I have this message and I have this pictures, right? I can test, I can send a picture of a man to a lady and a picture of a lady to a man or vice versa, right? I can send a picture of a dog with my product to a dog lover, for example. So you can actually customize your message and show different people, different creatives. In television, you can't do that, right? It cannot be you and your, 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 uh, your other half and then you know, your friend watching TV and then each of you see a different thing on, you know, interpret the, the advertisement differently. That's impossible. So, but that's something you can do with digital advertising. All right, and then this point is very important, the ability to remarket specifically. As you know, like usually mm, in advertising, you say that you know, one advertisement usually is not enough to convince people to buy. But what if you can specifically target this person? So there are two ways you can do it. One is you advertise everywhere and anywhere, like McDonald's, everywhere and anywhere until you build a brand that is very, very well known, right? But you're going to spend like millions of dollars on advertising on that. The other one is you can do a remarketing campaign in a sense that you target people uh, with, a first, with, a, with a certain ad and then when they see that ad, right, they are actually being tracked. And then subconsciously, Later on, when they go on their Instagram, they see your ad on Insta story. After that, they browse a page. They also see another version or maybe a testimonial ad on, on the blog. They will see it anywhere and everywhere. So that creates the, the, the impression that your company is very trustworthy because it certainly spends a bit of money. But don't overdo it. Lah. Don't do it to the point where like YouTube, every time you see the same people again and again, uh, that, then that becomes a problem. Okay, so... Uh, let me see. Now I'm going into the, I'm going to show you a live case study. Okay. I'm going to show you that live case study of uh, uh, this particular Facebook page that I just created two days ago. All right. So I just wanted to debunk the myths, like I said, and I wanted to show you an actual uh, real life case study that I, you know, I created specifically for this webinar. So to clarify, this business does not even exist. All right. It does not exist. Uh, it doesn't have a website, okay? It doesn't even have a logo. This business doesn't exist. Basically, I worked with a, a, one of my friends who is a personal trainer and he's looking to get more leads for his, uh, you know, personal training classes and all that. So it's all a matter of tweaking the angle and writing a campaign, right? So I'm going to show you the page now. Let's see. Okay. Let's see. Where is it? Um... Give me a while. Okay. Okay, can you guys see my Facebook page now? I'm just gonna show you live. You guys can see it, right? Is it on the right page? Let me see. Uh, pages. Okay. Somebody is able to annotate. Okay. Yeah. If you have any questions, by the way, you just uh, feel free to, you know, blast away in the comments and I can address them if it's a right. If not, I will try to go, go back to it at the back. So pages. Okay. Your pages. Yes. Let's see. Uh, where are my which page is it? Um, so some I recently created. Ah, okay. Fit Tribe SG. Right. Early on, you saw. Right, you saw that I basically uh, asked my designer to do to create a logo. Our designer to create a logo for me, right, in the middle of the night. <laughs> so as I say, it's just a temporary thing called Fit Tribe, and then he created three logos, right, and I I selected this one, right. So that's why we are using this logo. Um. Okay. So uh, yeah, and then you can see over here. It's a brand new page. There's nothing, there's no post. There are only four likes, not even 10, not even the first milestone yet, right? And there's really nothing. I just put up a cover photo and the logo and I name it Fit Tribe Singapore and I customize some of the things inside, right? And then you can see the page here, there's no ratings and it was created on July 2nd, 2020. That was two days ago, right? I created this page two days ago and I simply ran an ad for it, right? An effective ad for it. So. I'm just going to show you the results, right? All right, you can see these are all the inquiries coming in. 
you can see this is just two days ago, by the way, but you can see this is the time. This is 12.15 today. This is 11.48, 10.30, 7.30. And then the rest was just yesterday. It, it, bear in mind, it took me some time to get ad approval as well. So it really was just, you know, I, I said less than 48 hours, but in fact, it was much lesser than that. You know, within 24 hours, there were leads starting to come in. Yeah. So, yeah, you can see. Okay, I will share with you how you can do create a campaign, something like this later on, but you, it's really, um, yeah. Okay. All right. So I hope that's, that explains a lot. Um, yeah, come back here. Mm. Uh, okay. Yeah, so what I wanted to demonstrate in this case study is that you could actually create, you, even if you don't have a website, you don't have a physical venue, you have no, okay, by the way, this, this is not a gym or anything. There's no physical venue. There's no business presence. What we ran is actually an offer. So we said, um, uh, we basically said that we are getting five people to get to exercise together in the park and going to charge them a monthly fee for that. Can you imagine five people just exercising the park together, uh, coached by a trainer, of course, and then we charge them a monthly fee for that. So, so that's as, sim as simple as that. So you see, you can actually test your business idea if you know how to do this. Or if you, uh, I mean, if you have an existing business, right, you're posting tons of stuff again and again. I understand how it is like you're posting on social media, but you're not seeing traction. But you just do one thing right and you can see inquiries and leads coming in and eventually sales. So this is how it works, right? Okay, so now I'm going to go right into the meat of the whole thing. Okay, uh, this part, I'm going to share with you the five ingredients towards creating a powerful direct response digital campaign. I call it direct response because I don't beat around the bush. I'm, as I always explain, it's not really about creating a lot of little, little posts and all that. It's really about creating something that brings in leads, inquiries, customers, and sales. Um, I'm going to share with you the five components. It's actually very, uh, it's, it's nothing, it's not rocket science. It's just that you have to understand, take the time to understand each of these components well, and uh, you know, and you'll be able to create a campaign like that. But uh, having said that, right, I don't have enough time today to cover every because each of these components. If I really want to go deep into it, right, we can spend maybe a few hours on each one, or even a day on on certain areas like copywriting. It's worth a day on its own, right? But I'm just going to tell you some of the fundamentals and simple, uh, you know, principles uh, that that will work, right? Sorry, sorry about that. Okay, um, let me see. Let's go into it straight right away. Okay, so if you have any questions, by the way, because at the end of this, we have a Q&A where you can ask your questions. But, you know, um, if you have any questions right on the spot about some of the examples that I'll be sharing and all that, feel free to ask. You know, I think it'll be better because by the time we go to the end, maybe you've probably lost some of the information at the front. Uh, can you show us that? Yes, I'm going to show you the ad later. And you'll be very underwhelmed by it. Huh? Let that, let it also can. Okay. I will show you. All right. Now. Okay. This is the first point. The first ingredient is attention. Like I said, right? Nowadays, our attention span is very short. We're using social media, you know, um, scrolling around all the time, you know, and there's so many people, uh, you know, so much on going on on our space, Instagram, Facebook, and all that. So the key thing is you have two seconds to make an impression. Run, run something to really, you know, get, uh, get attention of people. Uh, you know, so that you can, you know, uh, let me see. Just uh, sorry, that broke. Out. Okay, yeah. So earlier on, I, I was talking about Ulo, right? So this was one of the ads we did uh, several ads for them. This was one of the ads that we did for them. So it started uh, like this. It was simply a dog with eyebrows, and then it says one. You uh, when that YouTube brow tutorial doesn't turn out quite right, and then um, the first three lines is very important as well because it gets people interested. We are like Etigo which was already a popular app, but for things like salon, spas, massage, gyms, and things to do. So this was the hate hater. All right. I, have a few, I mean, I have a few um, tips on, on how to get attention. The first thing is use bright colors. Try to use uh, thought-provoking images, micro expressions, weird imagery. Try to be a bit odd because that will really stand out. Okay. And sometimes make use of space. Meaning, for example, right, let's say this is a box your ad right in the middle and then there's a lot of white space at the side. I know it sounds very funny and contrary to like common sense, right? Let's like say you maximize the space. 
But sometimes when you do something like that, it just stands out because when you scroll this, you know, it draws your attention to what's in the middle. If you're using video, use something surprising or whimsical. Okay, the right music can also make or break an ad. So, uh, you know, these are some of the some of the areas you might want to look at. I'm going to show you a few examples and just dive right into it. Right. Okay. So a picture speaks a thousand words, and the right creative can make or break it. Uh, make or break your ad, right? So these are some of the, you know, these are some examples of uh, ads we've created. Mm. So for example, let's look at this one. Uh, this one was actually an ad for Mega Furniture and they wanted to do a, a, a sale, a one day sale. And basically the sale was 20% off. So 20% off. So imagine if you run a 20% off ad, uh, how many companies are running, you know, things at 20% off? Everything's on sale right nowadays. Everything's on sale, literally 10%, 20%, 40%, 50%, 50%. So we knew that a 20% ad, chances are it's not going to stand out. So we came up with this idea, fifth item at $1. If you calculate, right, do the math, right? The fifth item at $1 is as good as 20%. Uh. Even if the fifth item is free, it's still 20%. So imagine 1,000 item, right, in the order of the highs to lowest. Let's say you buy five of it. The last one is free. That's 20% off, right? So, but it's the angle of it. The creative was very simple. It's just a $1 coin and then a space around it. Okay, and then CSA, so it's been a really good year. We're proud to announce that we've served more than 10,000 happy customers and our average rating da, 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 is this. You know, we're so, and, and that's why we're doing this sale, something like that, all right? Over here, you can see this one is like, basically, this is a great way to explain why is dentistry important and it's pink. It's very bold because even though he's missing an eyebrow, the first thing you notice is his smile. He's missing an eyebrow, but you notice his smile. So ads like this really stand out and get people's attention. Not necessarily you have to you know, use Photoshop or get designers to do something very fancy for you or creative for you. Sometimes using real life images works uh, you know, very well or in some cases works even better because they're authentic. In this case, you wanted to show that uh, there are many customer customizable options um, for the fabric, bed frame, and mattress, right? So you can customize the colors and fabrics and all that. So in the copy, I don't have the copy here, but it says like in detail, you know, how many, like 80 colors you choose from, 20 different fabrics, including stain proof, da 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 da, da you know, and, uh, you know, luxury fabrics and all that. But the creative was simply a bit, and then we laid out all the, you know, fabric textures on it so that it looks very filling and right away it, it communicates a message. Okay? So this is basically um, like, you know, in terms of attention, these are some of the points to look at. So like I said, when I said micro expression, it means like, uh, you know, based on our research, ads that show, firstly, if, you're, if you have no clue, just use dogs or babies because those two always work for some reason. Secondly, micro expressions is uh, expressions of people doing very, uh, it's like, it's more than a normal smile, you know, like a normal smile like this. It's a very, it's a very uh, unnoticeable smile. Like you would just want to notice it. But if you do something like it's a very shocked or, you know, like, or crying or, you know, like pain, these are what we call micro expressions. And this works very well in getting attention. Okay. Maybe, okay. I'm going to show you also some of the video creatives. Let me see. How do I do that? Um, uh, I think it's, sorry. This is the first time I'm doing webinars. So I'm not too familiar with where I, where I should be clicking and opening the file for you to see. Let me see. Here. All right. So for example, let me see. I show you some real life examples. Okay, can you see this actually? Are uh, you guys seeing my folder? Okay, great. Um, so for example, we there are so many ones. Right? Okay, so maybe let's say, for example, these are just some examples I drew out for the webinar. So for example, let's say the promo code ad. We did something as simple as this. It's like a dog typing, but it's just weird and a, a bit awkward. So it gets it gets the job done. This one did well. All right. Uh, Sunoco Energy is one of our clients. And then we, we for example, during the COVID uh, period, the circuit breaker, we did a creative like this using Zoom. We recorded the entire thing with Zoom at home. 
uh, this is actually the Sunoco team. These are really their staff members, right? And we did a Zoom call together. We just simply cut it out like this. And then it was something like, you know, electric CV is going through the roof, working from home, you know, we've got your back. So it's something very, very straightforward. Yeah. If you notice, you can see me inside too. <laughs> huh? Oh, they can't see the video. You can't see the video? Are, are you guys able to see? Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Okay, okay. Let me see. Uh. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize you guys can't see. Okay, I'm going to share with you now. Share video clip. Okay, can you guys see my screen now? Okay, I'm going to show you now. Yep. The promo code one I was talking about is this one. Can you guys see? <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, this is very simple. But like I said, it's a bit weird. Oh, your chat box is blocking. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so something like this. All right. And then the other one that we did was like for Ulo. Um, uh, during the circuit breaker, we did this. We recorded this using Zoom entirely and then just made it into an app like this. These are the Sinoco team members and we just did it. It was very fun working there. And then, uh, yeah, we were working from home, we put it back. Because basically it's electric uh, retailing, right? Electric retailing, um, which is, uh, if, if you know, if, you, if you've not switched to an electric retailer yet, you can save 30% on electricity bills. Shout out to Sinoco. Please go and sign up with Sunoco Energy. Yeah, this was another one we did, um, which was about the bills going up in circuit breaker. You know, you're spending a lot of time at home and using all your electric city appliances. This is the old one, but yeah, that works to explain. Okay, and then, yeah, let's go back to this. Mm. All right, let's go back to the webinar, okay? Mm, okay, all right. Uh, let's turn on this. Okay, great. Sorry for the technical error there. Uh, I hope that shows you some examples of uh, creatives that you can do. You know, always try to do something that is a little bit whimsical, a bit odd, and it gets people's attention. You know, depending on what you're advertising, of course, you're going to go for a very upscale, then you can't, you know, possibly do that. But always try to find a unique angle. That's what I'm trying to say. All right, I'm going to go right into the next point. If you have any questions, feel free to drop in the box and we'll get back to it later. Um, the second thing is traffic. So like I said earlier, you know, back to the example of ULO and also the example of my poor advice to my colleagues back then, right? Uh, the key thing ultimately is still traffic. If you have the best, uh, you have the best ad, right, in the world and nobody sees it, right? You're right. You wrote the best message, best copywriting, best whatever ad and nobody sees it. You're just posting it somewhere or sharing your own WhatsApp group, right? It's something like you are, you know, like what I said here, it's like pasting posters in your own office for your own group to and admire and you know, say, wow, this is such a great offer, but somehow nobody is coming to buy. The answer is simple because nobody gets to see it, right? So traffic is very, very crucial uh, you know, in, 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 uh, in getting a uh, ROI-based kind of campaign. You must get enough people seeing your content or whatever you're writing or whatever that persuasive ad is. You must get enough people to see Okay, I even go a little bit more extreme to say that supposing even if you took a piece of paper and you just wrote so far 399 or 599 or whatever, 1099, and then somehow you showed this paper to a million people, it's just a blank piece of paper with the words so far and then the top and then the price. You might even get a few buyers because your audience is big enough versus you have a very attractive ad, right? But you keep it hidden at home or hidden in your office. Nobody gets to see it. So that's why traffic is very, very crucial. Okay. So like I said, someone out there is looking for your product service. You just have to find a way to reach them. Okay. And by the way, I wouldn't recommend that you uh, boost your post. You know, a lot of people think that when I say advertising means I just boost the post. It's not that way because the targeting is way too simplistic and usually it doesn't produce very good results by boosting unless whatever you're promoting already is a very, very, very good offer. Okay. Then, you know, 
by all means, even a boost will help. It's better than nothing, right? So in, in terms of traffic, firstly, be clear of your target market, but be innovative with your targeting. Uh, what I mean by that is, you, for example, you, are, you know that your, tra your audience is uh, between 35 to 45 and they like maybe, okay, maybe you're trying to do targeting for financial planners, right? Um, the most direct way to do targeting for financial planners is to target finance. But you have to understand how Facebook actually, uh, you know, or you target insurance, finance, all that. But you have to understand how Facebook actually judges who is interested in finance. It's based on the people who've interest, interacted with finance ads or finance content in the last, uh, you know, in the recent uh, days or recent weeks. So who are those people who always interact with finance ads or finance content and all that? Any guesses? I mean, there are some legitimate customers, but a lot of times, you will get a lot of financial advisors themselves. So you end up getting the ads shown to other financial advisors. You know what I mean? Because you're targeting finance and the way that the, the algorithm works is, yeah, insurance agents precisely, yeah. So when I say be innovative, your targeting is think a little bit deeper. For example, you are doing an ad on financial advisors. Don't just target finance. You know, think who are these people that you, for specifically the product that you are trying to market. For example, you say you're marketing, uh, you know, uh, retirement insurance. What is the kind of people who will do that? What are the brands they're interested in? What are the interests that they have? And try to test that, right? And then go for that because those are maybe more likely to be the specific audiences that you really need. That's number one. Number two, uh, Facebook also works on the bidding mechanism, meaning the more you, that means the, the more people uh, target a keyword, the more expensive that particular keyword becomes. So all the common keywords, right? Like finance, everybody targets, or the banks, or the insurance companies, everything. That keyword would be very expensive for you to target. Try to think of something that's related, but not so obvious. So people don't really go and target those audiences, okay? Um, so that covers understand how Facebook, Instagram classified. Okay, one common misconception, right? When you talk about interest targeting, I have clients who ask me this, but I'm very private on my Facebook, Instagram. Right? I don't like any page one. Like I don't like any page. So how do they know like it wouldn't be accurate because I didn't like a wellness page. They wouldn't know that I like wellness. This is a very common misconception. Facebook and Instagram does not classify you based on the pages you like. They do, but it's a very small affinity. They classify you based on your interactions with other ads and other content. For example, if a furniture company runs an ad, right? It's marked as a furniture ad. And then you interact with that ad. Then they know that you're interested in furniture. So that's how it works. It's not like you have to like the furniture page or like Ikea or something like that. That's not how it works, okay? So I'm jumping all over the, pa the place here because I, you know, this is the first time. But, you know, anytime you have any questions, you can, you know, I'll just go into it. Speed test your audience. Don't just target one audience. When we run a campaign, we test at least five audiences, meaning we will test like, although we think that our audience is this group, you don't just, uh, you know, just target one audience. Most of the time, we can target five audiences or more so that you can see based on the measurable results, you'll be able to see if, how to target those audience. Uh, they have the data, I'll show you later on, okay? Uh, the specific tool. All right, and then use the right campaign objective. Uh, campaign objective. So this one is a little bit, a little bit more detailed. If you're actually, if you're actually um, uh, using the ads manager, right? You'll be able, you'll be familiar with this. There are several campaign objectives on the ads manager, engagement, leads, convergence, traffic, reach, et cetera, likes and all that. So which one should I, should I go for? Okay, the answer is that these audiences in Facebook are segmented into several components. There are some people on Facebook, right? You know that they love to like things. Like maybe, you know, the, my mom is one of them, you know, likes to like, share, like everything, share everything, right? So these are people we call engagers. They engage with posts a lot. They are very interactive with posts, but not necessarily they buy anything. They just love to comment, like, and share, right? So, uh, so basically, that that is uh, you know um, uh, the Facebook classifies this as engages, right? And then uh, another kind is conversion. Conversion is the most expensive objective because it's targeted towards people who are subset that are most likely to buy things. If you click on the ad on Facebook, like you see something selling something, right? And you click on it, and then you put in your credit card and buy it, right? Then you are marked under conversion. Or in some cases, when you fill in a lead form as well. Like many of you sign up for this uh, webinar through the ad that we launched two days ago, right? And that ad, 
when you sign up for the ad, right, you are also marked in as a conversion because you've converted in a way. That's how it's marked. So you will see more of similar ads because of your reaction in the ad. So understanding this, this is important because at different, with different marketing objectives, you want to reach a different audience. The right campaign objective will help you to also target the right audiences. Um, okay. All right. Okay. Uh, and then don't forget that you can also exclude audiences. That means exclude audiences, what would I mean? You, you know, it's not only possible to target specific audiences, it's also possible to exclude certain audiences. So when I use the financial advisor, Example, when you are doing a targeting for financial advisors, you will probably want to say, okay, I want to target, uh, you know, certain segments, parents, because they are more likely to buy insurance, et cetera, et cetera. But I want to exclude things like MDRT. I want to exclude things that are well-known financial advisors, speakers. I want to exclude these people because the people who like these things, chances are they are financial advisors themselves and we don't want to show our ads to them because if you're showing our ads to them, then it's like, you know, it's wasting the ad spend. They are not a valid prospect, right? And, and more, moreover, they might actually try to you know mess around with the, the, the whole thing. So um, that's what I mean by excluding audiences. You can exclude very specific audiences. For example, if you're you're purely trying to get new audiences, you are you are running an offer to only new customers, but you have a lot of existing customers. You want to upload your customer list and exclude all these audiences so that your existing customers don't see the offer and then come to you and say, "Why are you only creating an offer for new customers and not not us? We are your loyal customers." And you have a separate offer for your existing customers. So you're able to create very specific segments. Okay, I see a question from Michael. Are the slides going to be available? Uh, unfortunately, no, because I, I'm sharing quite a bit of, uh, you know, the, 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 the specific examples from clients here. And then I'm, I'm not sure if it's, you know, right to, to share their creative, uh, you know, in, in terms of slides. But we'll see what we can do. Maybe we'll do a simplified version and, and send it out or something like that, if you feel that that will be helpful. Okay, let's go into the third point. Am I? Okay. The third point is copywriting. This is actually the key essential part of the whole thing. It's a very, if you know how to do proper copywriting, it's, it's a very powerful tool. Uh, we keep hearing about copywriting, copywriting, copywriting. I'm sure if you know, if you're into digital marketing or marketing in general, you've heard the term copywriting, right? So what essentially is copywriting? Um, there are many definitions, you know, uh, to copywriting, but my favorite one is by a, quite a legendary advertiser many years ago. He said, copywriting is salesmanship in written words. That means today, if I'm selling you a product, right? I'm a salesman, I'm selling you and all that. Um, I can transfer my enthusiasm about the product and persuade you to buy the product. That is salesmanship, right? Essentially. Copywriting is powerful because it is translating this salesmanship into words that can be put on printed media or digital media and can be multiplied. Imagine you're one salesman, you create a very good pitch, and then now you can multiply it to 1,000 people, 10,000 people. That becomes very powerful. So basically, copywriting essentially is salesmanship in written words. What works for copywriting? All right. Uh, what has worked for me best? I mean, there are many different schools on there. This, this topic is like a big topic on itself, right? And there are companies that just focus on one thing, which is copywriting. Uh, you know, for me, what has worked is by using a conversational tone. Later, I'm going to show you some examples. But conversational tone meaning when people read the copy, they feel that you're talking to them. You know, not like a very factual, like, uh, you know, announcement kind of writing, right? A, a very relatable message that feels like somebody on the other side of the brand is talking to them personally. Later, I'm going to show you some examples. Point two, the headline and the first three lines are the most important parts of the entire copy. All right, about 50% to 60% weightage is in those three lines. Because if you're not going to attract the attention in the first three lines in the headline, most probably they're not going to read the copy. All right, and the other important line is the last line because people have a tendency of scrolling through and briefly, especially if it's a long copy, to skip most of it and going straight to the last point. That's why when sometimes you see some marketers, they always write PS, da 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 da, PS, da 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 da, right? Because they want to re elaborate the key points at the back of the copy. Okay? So more importantly, relate to your audience and think like a layman. This is a common, uh, common uh, problem with copywriting is that a lot of people, right, when they try to write a copy, uh, they write it as themselves. So for example, you are, uh, you are, let's say you are in jewelry. You know a lot of things about jewelry, right? So you, because you've been in the jewelry industry for five years, 10 years, or maybe you, you're just very good at this particular area. If you write a copy that is so, 
you know, technical, right? That only other jurors, you know, other people in the jewelry industry can understand, right? Then it's not a good copy because the copy is to layman audiences who might not know what you're talking about. In the same way, if I wrote a digital, cop uh, digital marketing copy, like I want to write about this webinar and I wrote a copy that's talking about very specific, you know, uh, keywords and terms and all that kind of stuff, like all the, you know, internal kind of lingo, like for example, CBO and all that kind of stuff, right? Nobody's going to understand what I'm talking about except other marketers who are already in this field. So it depends on your audience. So one way, you know, do not assume that the people know you know, really go to the base and explain to them what this product or service is about or, 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 or take the time to introduce it to them, you know, bit by bit. So don't assume that people know, already know, you know, what's in the industry or about the product. A very, very good example that I'd like to share is about a story. I put this beer here to remind myself of this, to tell you this story, right? So basically, uh, there was this particular beer brand. Don't ask me what brand, I cannot remember, but it's a true story, all right? <laughs> I have to find if you want to know which beer brand it is. But basically, it's a beer brand and this founder of this beer brand was on the train home and then this beer brand wasn't doing well at the time. It's a very big brand today, but at the time it wasn't doing well. And he met this legendary copywriter on the train and then he said, oh, you know, we do advertising, we're a copywriter and all that kind of stuff. And then he said, you know, since I'm free now and we're on the train, maybe this is one of our, you know, it's like a chance encounter, you know, in Chinese they call it. So I let me write a copy for you for free. I'm going to write it for you for free. So the guy said, you know, the founder said, sure, you know, maybe you can write for me. Okay, tell me, that, uh, so tell me what's unique about your product. Then this beer uh, founder basically, that's the thing, there's nothing really unique. Beer is beer. I mean, we can say it's a little bit better, a little bit worse, but it's beer. Lah. That's, that's it, right? So he said, there must be something unique about your beer. You have to tell me, you know, in order for me, right? Okay, I'll tell you what, why don't you just tell me the process of how you brew this beer? Everything from the beginning to the end, how you actually create the beer. Okay, this is something that I apply a lot in my daily work nowadays. When I meet clients, I ask them, tell me specifically the process of how you create this product, what is behind it and all that. Because, okay, so here's the point. So, so actually, after you go through the process, uh, this marketer and this copywriter picked up a key point. He said, you know, he said, so basically, you know, the beer got to go through this distillation process, da, 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 da. At, the end of, at the end of the process, right, we want to seal in the bottle. We actually inject oxygen into the bottle and then we seal the bottle to maintain, to, to, to actually seal, the, seal the, the beer in, right? And then he said, yeah, that is the point that I want. I think that can be the headline. Then this beer founder, right? This beer brand founder actually said, that's ridiculous. You obviously don't know anything about beer because all beer is created this same way. It's nothing special. You know, it's just the same way. Every bottle of beer, you also have the oxygen inject injected in and the suit, that's it. So this, this copywriter was very, you know, uh, shocked. He said, well, you, you don't trust my expertise. He said, I tell you what, you go and write the beer. You, I, I give you this ad for free and I even pay for your ad spend. You go and try. <laughs> you go and try and see whether it works or not. So the beer founder, you know, agreed. And, 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 and of course, no, no, no risk, right? So we went to try out the copy. And basically, the, the copy was every uh, bottle of ABC beer or whatever, right? You know, uh, goes through this process, you know, wow, very specific. And then every bottle is injected with oxygen to seal in the freshness, something like that at the end of it, right? So as you can see, if you are not a beer maker, it's something very attractive to most of us, right? Like when you see an advertisement like that, will you buy the product? I think there's a good chance you'll be at least interested to know more about the product. It really stands out, right? And then after that, everybody started to copy the headline because it did super well. And other beer companies say, we also inject oxygen into our beer. We also do that, you know, and everybody tried to jump on the bandwagon. But the moral of the story here is that sometimes, right, we have, professional blindness. When I say professional blindness means we are too, uh, you know, uh, well-versed with our product that we don't see it from a layman point of view. We are too technical that we don't see what's special about our product. So sometimes you get a third party to see maybe, you know, somebody's not in the street, a friend or whatever, to give you some ideas or clients to tell you actually what do they like about your product. Okay, and don't overlook the process. Okay, you wanted to see the ad that I did for Fit Tribe Singapore, right? Uh, yeah, Benedict, you want to see the app? This is the app. Okay, it's very simple. The first thing is, this ad is only targeted towards people who live in Bukit Panjang. So everyone who sees this ad lives in Bukit Panjang. But despite that, I ask the question, do you live in Bukit Panjang? Why do I do that? Because it sounds like it's speaking to them. You know, it gets them to say, hey, that's me. Let's read on. But actually, in fact, everybody who sees this ad lives in Bukit Panjang. 
All right, we're starting a new tribe here. What's this about? Fitness doesn't need to be complicated. It doesn't have to be expensive. It needs to be sustainable. It needs to be accessible. What are your USPs, right? All right, the headline is a two-week uh, two uh, trial to start, right? So break down your copy so that it's readable and use some point forms and emoji to help break it down. And don't worry about long copy. You, if you are doing a new product or service, right, you definitely need to have enough points to explain your product or service. So don't, don't, don't be worried about using long copy because if you're using a too short a copy, you're not going to be able to explain what is unique about this. So this is the copy. Right, we're starting a new trap here. 30 minutes of powerful, high intensity, scientifically backed training once a week. Actually, is HIIT, which is a common kind of training, right? Focus small classes. We keep our classes at a maximum size of five, which currently you have to do that so that our instructors can pay close attention to your form and progress. No frills, no contracts. We don't believe in sign-up fees on expensive long-term projects because we are not a gym. We don't have that, right? Just a small, transparent, sustainable monthly fee to compensate our coaches for their time. Fair enough. Uh, safe personalized training. You get personalized training plan tailored to your current level of progress. Our coaches are trained to adjust the program to your needs. At a location near you, because it's at a park in, in Bukit Panjang, so it's at a location near you. All our training is done outdoors uh, at an accessible and convenient location. The only equipment you need is a yoga mat because we don't have a gym again. Right? So the investment $59 a month, right? For four sessions of 30 minutes if you attend something. It's a subscription based kind of thing. So what I'm saying is that you have to look at your product in a way and find what is your key strengths and weaknesses. And then sometimes it's possible to turn some weaknesses into strength if you are able to phrase it in the right way. Okay. I think I'm a little bit overrunning, so I'm going to speed up. Okay. These are some other copies that we've done. Nature's Aid. Uh, this is a creative and copy, you know, um, for Scout Fitness. It's a gym, a personal training gym. When most, pe when most people go to the gym, the only thing that is lighter is their wallets. So something for them to relate to. This is starting the copy with a testimony. I love how soft and bright this product is. My skin, I also noticed, is breaking down hyperpigmentation. So my dot, 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 read on, right? Number one, skin peel for younger looking skin. Yep. So these are some examples of how you can write copy, okay? Next. All right, call to action. The fourth thing that's very important is call to action, right? So in other words, when you write a copy, don't beat around the bush. There's always a call to action. If you look back here in my copy, say, uh, you know, um, the investment for this, sign up for the program. There's always a button, shop now, book now. Whenever you go to the gym, <laughs> what goes, yeah, it is true, right? So tell your audience uh, what to do. Keep it simple. In the copy, ask them to say, buy now, you know, um, or, sign, or sign up or, you know, uh, sign up now or something like that. There's always, you, you know, you always have to be, have a call to action. Don't assume that by showing an ad, a very fancy ad, your, your customers know what you want them to do. They'll just watch the ad and say, wow, this is a great ad, but they wouldn't buy or wouldn't know. So you have to tell them exactly what you're trying to ask them to do. The next thing, make use of social proof or scarcity where applicable. You know, things like limited offers. Sign up before X date. An offer you can't refuse. refuse. Okay? So um, there are exceptions to this rule. All right. Uh, in terms of a call to action and all that, there are exceptions to making your call to action very specific. If the audience you're trying to cultivate is very high ticket, you would have to do several layers of ads. You can't just show them on and ask them for the sale because they're not going to buy and they're going to find your two sales. C. Certain products like uh, you know, FMCG kind of stuff and all that, you, you can definitely just straight away in the first copy ask for the sale. Okay. Um, in terms of social proof of scarcity, sometimes it makes sense to run an engagement ad. Earlier on, I talked about how engagement ads are you know, basically targeted towards people who like to like, comment, and share, but they don't buy your stuff, right? But sometimes it makes sense to run ads, some of these ads on uh, an engagement ad to some of these people so that you get a lot of likes, comments, and shares on your post. And then take the same ad with all this social proof and run it as a conversion ad to people who are more likely to buy so that you get the best of both worlds. You get a lot of social proof, a lot of comments, likes, and shares on your post. And then you, you send it to people who are likely to buy. They see, they feel that, wow, so many people like it, must be very good. And then it creates that, uh, that desire for the product, right? Okay. All right. Now we go to value ladder. What is the value ladder? Okay. Uh, this is what I call the value ladder. So sometimes, okay, this is an example for a dentist. Um, you know, for certain kind of, products or customers or services, right? We have to understand that the, uh, the lifetime value of a customer is at X dollars. First of all, you have to understand in what kind of industry in some kind of, some kinds of products, right? It's just buy once and then they will not use it again, right? So there's no real upsell to that, right? Example, funeral, funeral industry, usually it's one time, right? You don't 
upsell. Then, but things like uh, you know spas, salons, dentists, uh, you know, or anything like that, or even gyms, right? There's a chance to retain this client and then upsell them other products and services that are in line, or actually retain a client for a long enough time. So the average lifetime value you can't just weigh by the first amount that they're paying you upfront. You have to weigh by the potential value of this client and what's the lifetime value. So in the case of a dentist, right? There's so many things you can do. Six months checkup, cosmetics, retainers, whitening. Imagine if we did an ad to run to, to try for a normal dentist. Huh? Imagine you run an ad to ask people to do uh, braces straight away. The number of people who want to do braces are probably going to be very, very slim. And, and probably they, they will go for brands that they, have, they are more familiar with and all that. So it's not going to work very well. But you can do, for example, a free teeth cleaning one time. And you get all these audiences to come in quickly at the bottom of the ladder. After they come for a teeth cleaning, you sell them something like a whitening. Only for first-time customers, you can top up X dollars for whitening. You say, okay, why not? Since it's free, you might as well just top up X dollars for whitening. And then after that, you have them on your list and you remarket to them. And then slowly, they become a lifelong customer. And you know that these customers will end up spending more and more with you over time. So that's what I mean by value ladder. When we structure a campaign, right, we have to also take a look at the value behind uh, the entire value chain behind the particular product or service and also think of how we can increase our average order in terms of e-commerce. If you're looking at e-commerce, how can you get your customers to buy more products at each order instead of just one product? How can you increase the average order value? Those are some questions, right? Okay, now I'm coming uh, to remarketing the fifth component. The first four components are absolutely essential for any campaign that you're trying to create. The fifth is a bonus. It can be very powerful if you use it right. In fact, it's the most powerful component if you use it right. Um, but it's not absolutely necessary. You can do a simple one, but it can also get very, very complicated in advance, okay? So step one, always install a Facebook pixel uh, so that you can retarget your audience. That means if people visit your website, how can you deliver a, a specific ad to these people who visit your website or take certain actions? You have to install a pixel so that Facebook can actually track them and send them an ad on either Facebook or Instagram after they've seen your website. Because people who view your website, chances are they are the people who are most likely and most interested in your products or services, right? So they are the best audience to retarget. The most basic form of retargeting is retargeting the same ad. For example, if somebody sees your video and watches 50% but didn't buy the product, but the fact that they watch most of the video shows that they are quite, you know, at least interested in the topic. So why not retarget the video to them again and again a few times, right? Not all in the same day, but over a course of time. As you can see here, familiarity breeds trust and credibility, especially if it's cross-channel. So the more times someone sees an ad, the higher the likelihood to purchase. Each time there's a likelihood to purchase. The more times you see, there's, there's after, but after 10 times, it starts to fall because they are immune to the ad already. It's just like a noise to them. You know, they just automatically filter that out. Um, so this is the basic form of retargeting. Basically, it's just targeting that audience that is you know, a warm audience, a hot audience with the same ad. Now I'll come to a more advanced form of retargeting. A more advanced form of retargeting, you can actually target different messages to different segments. Okay, can even be time sensitive. I did not prepare a lot of uh, content on this, uh, I mean in terms of examples, because it's really quite detailed. But what I'm saying is, these are some things that you can retarget. For example, website visitors, video views, page engages, Instagram engages, and segment further by activity level. For example, I can target a specific ad to our, my top customers, customers who spend the most on my website. I'm tracking this and I can target an ad specifically to them and say that you are some of our best customers, like an ad that can literally say this, um, you know, you, thank you for being uh, my, our customer, you know, and all that. Uh, here's a loyalty discount, something like that and give them that special offer. You can do that kind of specific way. You can also do it in a segmented way. For example, a new audience, somebody who doesn't know a brand, sees a brand introduction video or brand introduction uh, ad to say that, okay, this is our product, this is a service, this is why you should choose us, da 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 da, da. Introduction, but don't, not really, you know, they might not buy at that stage, right? And then a few days later, so this, this is on Facebook. Two days later, they're on Instagram. Suddenly they see another ad, hey, it's the same brand. I remember I saw this ad two days ago. And then this one is like a client testimonial. A client testimonial, like a client saying, oh, after using this particular product, you know, my skin feels better, you know, and it's really, it's helped me a lot. But they don't know that it's being segmented like that. In the mind of the consumer, they will feel that it's just chance that they are just seeing the content. And then another day, they see, uh, you know, maybe two days from that, they see, by, uh, you know, limited uh, weekend discount, 15% off, 20% off. If they are already on the consideration stage, if they've seen the ad, they have awareness, and then after they have interest in it, 
they've heard good things about it and they're just procrastinating to buy, you know, sometimes all you need is a 15-20% promo code, limited time only kind of offer, right? Which is only shown to them, not to your normal customers. Only shown to people who have seen the first ad, second ad, and not made the purchase. They see a promo code. They are more most likely to take action. They are more much more likely to take action. Okay? So you can even go one step further after they've purchased. This is the end, right? One step further to show them another ad about like, thank you for purchasing our product. This is how you can use the product. That will really impress them, you know? Like you can show them like, this is we're demonstrating, founder demonstrate how to use the product. This is how we made the product. That actually creates brand loyalty and gets them to share the product with their friends more and more likely to have a repeat purchase, you know? Once somebody buys your product a few times, the first time, they're they are not so likely to buy a second time, but after they've purchased it two times, three times, they are most likely to become a repeat customer on and on. So in general, this is how you can actually retarget and uh, segment your funnel, okay? Wow, all right. I'm gonna save more time for the Q&A. So in essence, I hope that the presentation so far, you know, um, uh, has, you know, give you a broad overview of some of the key points um, the whole idea, right, of when we talk about ROI-driven digital marketing is to create, a, have a systematic way to turn your core audiences into interested prospects, interested prospects into customers, and then your customers into repeated long-term buyers and then advocates. So that's the whole objective of ROI-driven marketing. Okay. So, yep, I think, yeah, I'm done. That's it. You know, I hope it's been, it's been a good uh, sharing for you. And I'm going to save some time for question and Q&A. Anything you guys want to know specifically, any case studies or any industries or business you guys want to talk about? Mm. Okay. Christina, your mic is off. Okay, sorry about that. So um, before we proceed further with the Q and A's from the rest, um, well, perhaps we can give some time for everyone to you know, digest what you have uh, spoke about earlier. Um, but we do have three questions for you um, from three of our participants that have already sent in their questions prior okay. to joining the session. So um, I will read them out. So the first one is from Mr. Raymond Chen. Um, so here goes the question. We've always heard about growth hacking that seems to apply quite well for SAS, tech startups or B2C. We run a B2B services based company. So any thoughts or ideas um, on how to grow hack in our field, please? Thank you, Jim. Okay, great. I, I see a few questions that are similar from uh, Yuma and Ken about B2B marketing. Um, okay, first of all, uh, there's a misconception that if you're B2B, you cannot do your marketing on Facebook or Instagram because it's a more of a social or B2C channel. Not necessarily true. Um, the marketing, I mean, the whole idea is getting your message to the right audience. So the question is, are your decision makers, okay, it, it really depends on what B2B business. But the question is, is your decision maker on these digital platforms? And if so, the second question is, are you possible, is it possible to target these people using certain ways, right? So I give you an example. Uh, let's say for this webinar, right? In a way, if let's say, I mean, this is for SYEA, but supporting, supposing as a digital marketing agency or company, I wanted to target audiences, business owners who are interested to do digital marketing with us as a company, right? Uh, how would I go about doing it, right? There are a few ways. Of course, LinkedIn ads and all that, these are very specific ways you can explore, really it's a whole different thing, but it's a good way to you know, reach to these audiences. But Facebook ads, so for this particular seminar, we did not run any LinkedIn ads, we ran only Facebook ads, correct? But we were able to get these participants, founders and all that to join in. Um, it's about the message and, and, and in terms of the, and also the targeting. So in terms of targeting, I just share how, how the back-end targeting is done for this webinar. It's targeted towards page admins. That means if you see this ad, right, chances are you are page admin, we only managed to run it for a very short period of time because we were quite late in rolling out this, this thing. But um, chances are you are a page admin uh, of a business page. So that when you have a business page, right, Facebook actually has that targeting option. Oh, you know, I, I, I think I missed out on that part. I didn't manage to show you how, how the audience insights targeting work, right? Okay, I'll go into that after this and show a little bit into that. Um, the other kind of, you can consider different kinds of platform. For example, um, 
like uh, in terms of Google Ads, Google Ads can also work for very specific uh, search base. It really depends on, for example, let's say in our old company, we were supply of certain food products, right? Certain very specific food ingredient products like raw materials, right? So Google Ads will work very well on that. Uh, but you, the, the caveat is you need to have a landing page, right? So for example, somebody clicks on the, uh, uh, searches Google, like they are searching for, let's say, spring roll skin, right? And then because they are maybe a restaurant or spring roll maker, or, so it's in, sense, it's a, in a sense B2B, like, depends on what kind of B2B, they probably will Google that. And your ad comes out right at the top. Instead of, um, well, SEO also works, but in, I mean, the fast way is PPC. La. PPC actually gets you straight there, right? So when, when, when people click into that, right? And then if you have a pixel installed onto that page, right? Most likely when they are doing their research, they're not going to sign up with you straight away. And I mean, there are some people who do that, but maybe they will just read through and you know, they might not make the decision straight away. But if you have a pixel installed, right? You are able to target them on their personal channels. That means once they, although they are browsing that, but if their Facebook page is locked in on the same phone before, once they go to Facebook or Instagram on their personal channel, they will also see your brand. And you can craft that message to be very specific to them. That is, the, that, that is in terms of retargeting. So imagine if you're a business owner, today I Google several, like I, let's say, you want to give a specific example so I can use your example if, if you want to use the specific example. Like for example, okay, let's just say if I am in, uh, what's B2B? PSG grant, business loans. Is that a good B2B? Yeah, B, if you see there are a lot of PSG grants and business loan uh, examples on Facebook. So imagine you Google uh, PSG grant or business, uh, business loans uh, and then you actually see, you know, you actually browse a few pages and then, you know, you forget about it. You just want to have, then after you see a very convincing testimonial ad when you go on Facebook, then you are very surprised. Eh, how come I see this company again on my Facebook? Then in the, a few days later, I see it on IG, I see another set of stuff. So wouldn't that like kind of like, wouldn't that like, you know, um, in a sense, inspire, you know, uh, these people to feel that hey, this brand is quite credible and, you know, influence their decision towards making that purchase. Any tips to market a meat company? Meat company as in B2B or B2C? One trend that I've noticed, right, is that there are a lot of B2B businesses, right, that are trying to do B2C now in some innovative ways, right? Actually, I can show you a meat company. Oh, the B2C, then very straightforward. Very straightforward, which is do a good copy, you know, find the unique angles, run an interesting ad, get, get attention, target it to the right people, exactly what we've covered. If it's B2C, it's, it's quite straightforward. Depending on what kind of meat you do and where you get your meat from. So, for example, if I were running this campaign for you, I'd probably ask uh, where you, do you procure your meat from, what is the process, you know, how is it delivered, what's the delivery timeline, you know. So, all these things are good for the copywriting and, you, and, and the angle in which you can craft the ad. Right. For example, if let's say your meat is uh, especially fresh or you know, only from a certain country, they have a certain special quality, uh, then you should feature that in your ad and find a unique angle to add it in the creative if you can. If you can't, then just the copy uh, and have a call to action to get people to actually buy. You know? So let me show you another example, okay? since we are on this topic. I have another B2B kind of example. Let's see. Funeral service, right, the most direct way to run it, right, is Google Ads, to be honest. Because when that something like that happens, people are in shock, right? The first thing they will do is they will Google. So you definitely have to run a Google ad to be on top, right? The first thing, when, when imagine when someone passes away, right, you visit, uh, you, you will hear about the news, you go to the house, right, and then you will, uh, you know, maybe grief, of course, and then after that, you will actually get this arrangement done, so you will Google. So you have to do a good landing page, important, and a Google ad. And your Google ad, the copy has to be something that is very, that stands out because there are going to be a few of the similar services ads that are going to be there. So how can you make your copy actually stand out and uh, you know, really uh, get people to straight away sign up, take action? In fact, funeral service is very direct. If you, even if you put the phone number there, people are just going to call you straight away on the Google ad if they see it there. All right. Um, let me see whether I can show you the... Okay, I'm going to show another example similar to the, the, fit, the uh, fit Tribe one that I shared, okay? I'm going to share another example uh, about unique angles and B2B. Just food for thought and I think maybe it might 
Let me just let me just go into this. Okay. So we have this particular case study. This is uh, one of our clients. Let me see. This is some, um, okay. All right, I'm gonna show it to you. It's all about the message. Uh, okay, see my screen first uh, over here. Okay, so basically, right, um, can you guys see this over here? This is actually um, this is actually a, a, con a carpentry contractor. So basically, he is strictly B two B. He doesn't he doesn't have a B two C brand. He works with IDs, all right, or rather they work with IDs uh, and gets their contract, con you know, contracting work done behind the scenes. Uh. So basically, as a company, but it's something like an ABC Private Limited. It's not really a front facing brand. So, but he wanted to try to you know go to consumers directly. He wanted to open a sub. B2C kind of channel, right? So how we don't have a website for this. Similarly, we just created a logo. Okay. Actually, he's a generic carpenter. So he actually does carpentry like kitchen and all that kind of stuff. But if we ran that, right, it's too common. You know, there's so many generic carpenters around. And we felt that there will be a niche for walk-in wardrobes. Like nowadays, ladies like have a very, you know, it's like a glamorous walk-in wardrobe, very luxurious, right? So we actually created this page called SG Walk-in Wardrobes. And we, you know, we just posted some designs and photos, but actually nothing much, as you can see. Same thing, 20 likes and follows. There's no, you know, uh, not much content. And then now I'll show you the back end. Yep. So, very subjective. Uh, actually, if you tell me a specific case, I might be able to, you know, give more specific answer, but um, there are many, many ways of like doing it. So you can see, yeah, these are the, these are the inquiries, you know, that, that came in when we ran the campaign. Like you can see, yeah, actually real inquiries, just to show the conversation is not like, you know, uh, people who are actually sending their floor plans. Yep. What is the floor plan? This is my number, call me. Right. Yeah, so these are legitimate leads coming in. So even for, for you know, if you had a good angle and a good page, Sometimes you are able to pivot very quickly into some sub channels like this. Project based business. What kind of project based business? Is it like a very complicated B2B like consultancy or something like that? Project based. Project based yeah. business. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, while waiting for Derek to reply you on what kind of project based business, um, since we're mm -hmm. already at that topic, um, okay. I guess project based business, uh, oh, he's already applied or replied, so maybe you can answer that first. He mentioned uh, yeah. project based business like supplying equipment for a business and helping people to build a system, for instance. Okay, uh, it really depends on how niche, if it's a system that a lot of business owners can use. Right, like for example, marketing is something that a lot of business owners could use. Right, uh, really depends. If, if it's a very specific, like a search base, search base. To be honest, like uh, example, you know, I had somebody who approached us to do something like, what was that? Uh, a very uh, a machinery that only carpenters can use. You know, like a high tech, like big cogwheel machinery that cuts marble and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that the, the kind, right? It's very hard to reach on. Facebook, IG, to be honest, you probably have to use Google because those are search based. Like I'm a carpenter and I want to, you know, like buy this thing and I'm going to search and do my research. So you have to do your SEO or these things. That is, that is uh, for, for this kind of stuff. Let's say it's a very generic um, project, like, you know, like accountancy, you're doing accounting work or marketing work, you know, that a lot of businesses could use, right? Then you sometimes it's as straightforward as running an offer or something that, or, or you can even run a lead magnet, like, um, create a, a lead magnet. In, in, what I mean is basically something like a small ebook, but you don't have to do it very fancy. It's very straightforward. Just put in some key things or knowledge that people should know about it and then put it up online and then run an ad and then get people to download it for free. So when they download it, you get the ad, you get the lead and you get the right to co contact them. But most, most, most importantly, they get to read the 
lead magnet and they feel more convinced in terms of like your expertise, what you can do for them, etc. So that's what we call a lead magnet ad. Um, and then the other way is if it's something that's more complicated to explain, right? You really got a value add. So you can organize, for example, a webinar, like something like this, you know, but on for more for commercial purpose, you can organize like webinars and then, you know, um, have a team of people that actually value adds to that particular segment and then explain like what you do, your value, how you, how you're going to do and all that. And then at the end of it, have a call to action. So at the end of the webinar, say, you know, uh, get them to actually sign for consultation or appointment or something like that. Right. Is it good to create the content? Yes, it is. It is. If you are doing something very specific and all that, yes, you probably have to create some content on that. Yeah. Uh, okay. I think I accidentally missed out one point. Christine, can I just quickly hop back into that because I I missed out one very thing that I wanted to show, which is the audience insights tools that will be useful for for everyone here. Sure. Let's go into the audience insights. Okay. This is Facebook audience insights, right? To find this page, right, it's very simple. You just go in Google Audience Insight. Click, 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 you end up inside here, right? So I like to use Google for all my lazy shortcuts, right? Or you can also go through the long way with Business Manager and all that. Audience Insights allows you to see your audience. So for example, you're right, you get to see the live audience. Let's say I type in Singapore here. You can see that 3.5 to 4 million people in Singapore are on Facebook. This is the demographics, right? So let's say I want to do a specific target. I use this to plan my targeting. For example, I'm targeting let's say 35, maybe 30 to, uh, 30 to 35. By the way, when I run an ad like this, right, I usually don't just run 30 to 35 unless I'm very, very certain. If not, I will usually run like 30 to 35, 35 to 40, 40 to 45, and then I will split test everything and see really you know, whether my theory is right or sometimes you, know, you could be totally wrong. End up an audience that you think will not buy a product ends up being the ones. Yeah, in terms of interest, right, you can actually go into so many different interests. You can just type and you find, for example, you can say even digital marketing, there should be an interest, right? All right. When I click digital marketing, you can see the audience actually falls to 90K to 100K. So this becomes the audience. You can layer them further. When you add a plus interest, that means it's actually a additional, uh, means it can be either or. Uh, you can also target like live events, you know, depending on what you want. There's so many different targeting options, right? People who are in family and relationships, they're dating and all that, okay? Then under connections, you can target specifically people who are connected to your page. Certain pages you are connected to, you can actually target them or you want to exclude them. Okay, then you have their advance, uh, you have their work, if their parents, uh, life events is one that I really like. If they are on a new job, new relationship, this sometimes is good if you're, for example, you're selling a engagement ring, you know, things like that, yeah. And you can even uh, target by their purchase behavior. When you do something like this, there are a lot of little, little hacks. La. I'm just going to share a few. Engage shoppers are people who actually have purchased behavior on Facebook. That means they've bought something on Facebook in the last 30 days or so. Then they are classified as engaged shoppers. So if you're running e-commerce, right? Sometimes people like use engaged shoppers. It really depends. Yeah. So this is a tool that you can use to segment your audience. What is a good size for our audience? It depends on your ad spend. If your ad spend is small, very, very specific. If your ad spend is big, then you'll need the audience to be big enough for it to be able to run. Okay. So yeah, this is some ways that you can segment. And then there's another thing that you can also... Uh, okay. Uh, you can also do your research this way. For example, let's say I want to target people who like furniture. All right, this will show the affinity score. Just now I was talking about affinity score, right? This is the relevance, this is the affinity score. So actually, if I want to target furniture, maybe instead of that, I can target this. You know, instead of targeting furniture right away because there is a high correlation between baby land, for some reason, and furniture. There's a high correlation be between these brands and furniture, right? And some of the other brands that has a category that is correlated are these. So people who like furniture, most probably they like canvas, they like uh, Renopedia, makes sense because they are interior design, right? Uh, most likely they like Sephora for some reason and they like all these brands, Air Asia. So <laughs> these are what we call affinity, you know, in terms of tracing the affinity. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. What else? Wow, it's pretty interesting where you can actually target um, based on the interests and their current relationship status and so on. So, 
something good to uh, look at is also uh, there's a relevant question from Clarice um, following Derek. She actually asked if there are any ad spend benchmark um, to advise on, you know, whichever stage you are at, perhaps uh, when you're at awareness stage or, you know, at the conversion stage, what, what are some of the benchmarks that we should okay. look, like, look at? Right. So actually for that, right, I, let me just uh, come back here to the, let's just close this sharing first. To answer that, uh, actually in terms of ad spend, it really, really varies. Um, for, it depends on what stage you are. If you're testing on your own, you can just spend $100, $200, like, you know, like for example, if you want to run like like what I did with Tabata Tribe, you can actually spend very little and test it out on your own if you if you if you go and do the work, right? Um, if you're in if you are serious about growing a brand or business or company, uh, for us for all our clients, we advise them to start with one thousand a month at spend. So you most so in fact all of them, uh, they start with a minimum of one thousand a month at spend, but they do scale up because for example, if the one thousand at spend actually makes them five thousand or ten thousand dollars in sales. Like they can see a very straightforward correlation uh, that, inf that, that, that the sales of coming, especially e-commerce is the most straightforward, right? Because you spend how much, you get how much. But let's say, you know, they do see a correlation. Sometimes they'll increase the ad spend over time. So we do have clients spending like 10,000 a month or more in ad spend, you know, because it's making them much more in sales and revenue because it's a very direct correlation. It also depends on the amount of leads that you can handle. For example, there, there, we had an interior design client we ran an ad for her, for, her, for her and then there were too many leads. It was a good problem. You know? She said, I have too many leads. Can you scale it down the ad spend? Because I cannot cope with the leads and you know, a lot of them are going to waste because I cannot create my proposal for them in time. So it really depends on how you're planning to scale your company and your business. Uh, and usually when we advise, we advise based on the overall picture. For example, if you're ID and you are solo, then we will start with a small ad spend. If you are ID and you want to create a systematic approach in which you're getting, let's say, 10 leads a day, right? And we have to work towards that and, and try to find a way to, you know, create that for you, that's systematic so that you can scale your business. When you bring in other IDs, you can tell them, you know, we have the leads taken care of. You just got to scale, scale and, you know, sell in a certain way and all that. Yeah. So that is uh, with regards to ad spend. I can show you, okay, but please, this one, um, let's just not, let me just uh, stop this first. I'll show you behind how it looks like, okay? The ads manager. And then I'll answer the question about the Instagram targeting as well. Okay. Wow, am I able to filter out certain things or not? Let me see. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see this one, all right. That's <laughs> Let me see. Um, I'm just uh, let's see. I can't. Okay, if I can, I will screenshot because it has the clients, uh, you know, detailed in you know stuff inside and all that. But basically, through the ads manager, right, you'll be able to see um, like how much money you're spending on a specific campaign. So there are some that we are running like ten campaigns, twenty campaigns, you know. And this particular campaign, we are spending, let's say. Our ad budget total is like say ten thousand a month. We are spending one thousand on this campaign, one thousand on that campaign, one thousand on that campaign, and from this one thousand dollars on this particular campaign, let's say to sell us particular sofa, right? Um, we we see like one thousand spending. Then on the inside ads manager, you can see that because of the tracing and tracking on the pixel, let's say there are ten thousand dollars worth of ad to cut. Meaning there are people who see the ad and then they add their product to cut about ten thousand dollars worth from the one thousand ad spend, for example, and then from this ten thousand ad to cut, right? Actually, maybe half of them check out and make the purchase. So it becomes like a one is to five. We call it the return on ad spend, ROAS. Meaning for every $1 in ad spend, you're getting $5 in sales. So obviously then if that's a good figure, you will want to scale your ad spend because net return is positive, especially if you are selling FMCG or e-com kind of products where you don't have a limitation on how much products you can produce. You just want to scale and sell. The more you sell, the better, right? Yeah, but there's also a point of a saturation. So for example, at a certain point, uh, it, it, it gets harder and harder to scale that spend because there's a limited number of people in Singapore who want to buy this product and there are other people competing with you. So you can run a very effective ad, but if you are increasing your ad spend too much, then it comes to a point where you are like basically competing with yourself and you know uh, wasting too much ad spend on that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what else? 
would you do things differently for Instagram marketing? Okay, when you do the, uh, when you do, just now I didn't cover one thing. When you, when you uh, place the product on Facebook as manager, it actually owns Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, and it also has audience network. What, what we talk about audience network, you know, sometimes when you play games, like you use or apps or certain apps, right? You will see an ad come out, right? Uh, some of these apps spaces are also owned by Facebook. And then there are also others that they work with partners. For example, if you go and see Miss Tamjia, the blog, you scroll, 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 and then you see there's a banner there, right? Uh, maybe I can just, uh, well, time is limited. Let's see if I can show you quickly. You see an ad banner there, and those are also targetable spaces. So it really depends. You can, you can place your ads on all these spaces as well, or you can just place it on Facebook. So what I like to do, right, is for the basic ads, the, the top layer, the top funnel, I will just target it in Facebook and Instagram because that is the prime space where people are actually searching for content and they were more likely to read the ad and react to the ad. And, but for retargeting, right, I will just put it everywhere and anywhere so that it is, the brand awareness is everywhere, right? So for example, when I say the, this is Miss Tam Jia blog, but I'm just using this as an example because I've seen our ads on this. But let's say uh, even like BBC and a lot of other channels, they are all linked. So I can actually place ads here. I can also place ads like here and all that. So when I, but you, you think about it, right? You don't, you don't normally read these uh, parts in the article unless it's something familiar to you and you are already considering, then you'll pay attention to it. That's why when we do targeting, we target maybe the key channels for Facebook, Instagram. And of course you have to customize the creative to fit the spot. Like for example, Insta story is a long one, right? Ideally you can create a creative that is that format, the long format, and then different uh, formats for different spots. Um, and then, it's a bit of work at the beginning because you've got to do all this thing. But once you have it set up right, you can just let it run. It usually runs for quite a while. We've run some ads for clients for months and months, three or four months, the same kind of things. And it's still doing very good, you know, and getting very good results. Yeah, so for retargeting, you can basically put it everywhere. So when people actually read a blog or read an article, they see your brand at the site as well. They, uh, they're reminded about it. They've probably seen the main ad and then they see a small ad here, you know, like all this, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's that. Okay, that's really insightful. So uh, we do have uh, two more questions that wasn't covered from uh, previously when they have registered. So uh, I will move on to that. For um, the previous topic, when you are actually talking about um, drilling down towards the cost per lead and so on, right? I believe there will be a lot of burning questions over here from the participants. Um, perhaps, Jin, you can also share your email address over here. So um, if they, any of you over here would actually like to speak to you further on, um, on the special drill down, um, they can reach out to you directly as well. So uh, while uh, we let you write down your email address in the group chat, I will continue on with the last two questions that were uh, initially sent in to us before the webinar has started. We have one from Mr. Terence Lim. Um, so how can we draw attention to viewer to inquire your services? Uh, I, I think some of your slides previously would have already uh, addressed that. Um, I think this would also uh, link very well with the other question from Mr. Lex Lim. Perhaps um, you can try to answer both together. Uh, from Mr. Lex Lim is how can we generate quality leads? to e-commerce marketing for transport industry. Yeah, so I guess both of these questions are pretty similar. Mm. Um, also pretty similar to uh, like questions previously from uh, the rest that have been posted over here, you know, for meat, ta uh, targeting for selling meat, targeting for selling lorries to companies. So um, yeah, perhaps you can also uh, explain a bit more about this. Yeah. Okay, sure. Uh... I think in terms of transport, is it B2C or B2B kind of transport? Like if it's a B2C transport, for example, limousines and all that, right? Then you have to find a very specific, for example, your transport, you can do anything and everything. Like you can drive them anywhere, right? For example, but you don't want to do a marketing message that is too vague because, you know, you, it doesn't, you know, like people are not, they're not going to save your number because it's so vague, right? Anytime I can get a limousine or some kind of taxi. For example, your transport is very, there's a, something you can do, but you don't always do, but you, you find that there's a niche. Example, a party bus or a transport to, let's say, J JB, right? You can actually create a campaign based on that, you know, something very specific and actionable or get them to say, add them, you know, um, you know um, for example, let's say they sign up for your, uh, you know, uh, WhatsApp, uh, you know, add you on WhatsApp or add you on WeChat, for example, or something like that, right? 
and then they get a discount coupon for the first trip or something like that. They get a discount. So make it like very actionable, like, you know, get them at the moment because a lot of uh, marketing on Facebook and IG, right, is really about taking action, taking kind of marketing. Not so much on, unless you are big brands like Coca-Cola and all that, then it's all about awareness, you know, about inspiring people, touching people and all that. But if you are typical, if you're SME and you know, all that, it's all about getting people to take action quickly and you don't want to lose their attention and all that. So have something very actionable. So the key thing is, Think of how you can position differently and uh, have something very, you know, uh, actionable right on the spot. Either to download something, sign up for something, give you their number or something like that, you know. At least they should always take an action. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for your valuable sharing and thank you everyone for your questions. If you do still have questions, don't worry about it. Um, just leave your questions over here. Alternatively, you can email to us at admin Elias, S Y E A dot C C. My admin will actually uh, write down the email address in the chat. Yeah. So um, I will be sharing a uh, screen next. Okay. So uh, before we move on um, to end the session, uh, we would like to request everyone to do turn on your your oh, really? precious video, and uh, let's take a picture together <laughs> before Thank we end the session. Yeah, but don't you. leave first. We would really appreciate your help on a quick feedback session of this. But um, yeah, do take uh, a quick three minutes, perhaps to just turn on your Thank video, you. You. and my admin uh, Michelle will actually be taking a screenshot of everyone. <laughs> yeah, so uh, let's start with let's start with the first batch. So uh, everyone, please smile. <laughs> Sorry, I That's need to share, stop my share screen yeah. first. <laughs> All right, everyone, let's go. So. I'll give another five seconds for everyone to turn on your screen. Let's take a nice picture together. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody's at home okay. and not prepared. They are cozy and comfortable at home. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's best to be at your cozy spot when you take a picture together, right? <laughs> Okay, so thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll count in a count of three, and uh, let's all take a picture together. So we do this twice, so at least everyone gets captured inside. All right. So the first batch, three, two, one. Okay, the second batch. Ready? Okay. Thank you, Benedict. Thank so you. So for the second batch, three, two, one. Okay, so um, let me share screen again. Um, if you want to, you can turn off your video. Um, share screen on this. Okay. All right. So um, we do have a small favor from all of you. Um, I hope uh, on behalf of the committee, we really hope all of you have enjoyed the session today. You know, we have such an insightful uh, sharing from Jean. And um, if you refer to our group chat box now, uh, our admin will actually be sharing this feedback link. We hope that you can just take a, a quick two to three minutes to give us some feedback so that we can bring in more interesting topics for you in the future as well. And do, um, do uh, put your feedbacks and your contact in the feedback form as well if you would like to attend more of our um, webinar sessions in the future. Thank so you. upcoming um, at the end of next month, we actually do have another one. This is really interesting because now we are talking about digital marketing. So um, for all of you out there, there are also uh, be it doing your own business or being you are financial or trading specialist or you know specialized in logistics and so on. Um, I believe this topic will be very interesting to you because it's on digital transformation, mainly on listing your products on e-commerce. And we also have Canon that is coming in to actually teach you a little bit of skills on how to better, uh, better take pictures of your products, videos, and so on. So stay tuned, um, take a picture, um, you know, stay tuned and let us know if you're interested. Um, do follow up 
on our event updates on any of this avenue. Just take a snapshot, take a picture, or you can also refer to our group chat link. We will actually be sharing this links over there. Uh, do follow us on our Facebook and also LinkedIn. Um, or if you would like to have a more in-depth read about the whole SYEA series uh, that we will have, do log on to our website, syea.cc. And if you do have any questions, um, be it you want to nominate someone, you, you do know someone that could be a potential speaker, do let us know. Um, write in to admin Elias, syea.cc. So I'll leave this on screen for another five seconds. All right, so we are done with the session. Thank you everyone for your time on a Saturday afternoon, and especially for Jean, you know, you take up your own personal time to share such valuable insights with everyone. And have a great, uh, have a great afternoon, everyone. See you. Thank you, thank you. See you. Everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye.